This episode is brought to you by my friends over at Populo. According to the World Economic Forum, 85% of organizations are expanding into new technologies like big data analytics, cloud technology, automation, and artificial intelligence. But what does this actually mean for employees who need to stay connected now more than ever before to their coworkers, their leaders, and the information they need so that they can feel involved and do their best work? And what will CEOs and leaders have to do to deliver the type of employee experience that's essential to attract and retain the best talent in this rapidly changing work environment? The critical thing here is employee communications and the role it will play in the digital workplace. That's where my good friends at Populo come in. They are one of the world's leading authorities on employee communications and employee engagement, and they have just released a brand new awesome guide called The Role of Employee Communications in the Digital Workplace. If you are a member of my newsletter, which you can sign up for at thefutureorganization.com, I'm going to be sending around a link to this white paper, so make sure to check your inbox. If you want to learn more, you can also check out Populo. It's P-O-P-P-U-L-O.com. Again, that's P-O-P-P-U-L-O.com. Also, my brand new book, The Future Leader, is coming out on January 29th. And it's based on interviews I did with 140 CEOs around the world and a survey of 14,000 employees done in partnership with LinkedIn. If you want to know the mindsets and skills you need to possess to lead effectively over the next decade and beyond, then you're definitely going to want to grab a copy, which you can do at getfutureleaderbook.com. Again, that's getfutureleaderbook.com. Most organizations are kind of a detriment to the health and well-being of the person, and it doesn't need to be that way. There's a lot of evidence I've uncovered surrounding that, but I think we can kind of get people, my, my grandpa used to talk about this too, that we can get people done through work. I think he said it like that. And that's the reason I love orienting my work towards organizations is because I think organizations are just the biggest and most influential social networks in the fabric of our society today. And that means they can be rallied to create a lot of improvement in people's lives if we start to ask those questions. That's Tom Rath, best-selling author and researcher who has spent the past two decades studying how work can improve human health and well-being. He has a brand new book coming out, which is called Life's Great Question, Discover How You Best Contribute to the World. Today you will hear all about how he started writing in the first place, even though it is not what he originally planned to do with his life. In our discussion today, Tom shares his thoughts on why the employee organization relationship is broken and how we can fix it. We also talk about how individuals can discover what and how they contribute to the world. Advice for leaders looking to be role models, why following your dreams is not the best approach, and much more. In particular, most of my uh, writing and research is focused on that nexus of people and organizations and how can we help people to lead better lives through the organizations that they're a part of. And one thing I've observed after 20 years of kind of following this area is that we're often so quick to look inward and think about self-development and our own brand and how we can improve personally. And the more I've studied these topics, my my big takeaway is that we can get more done and life is less stressful and more liberating when we find real concrete ways to focus almost all of our energies on the contribution we're making to other people. This is Jacob Morgan, best-selling author, speaker, and futurist. Welcome to the Future of Work podcast, where every week I speak with C-level executives, business leaders, and authors to explore how the workplace is changing and what the future of work is going to look like. The goal of this show is to give you the insights, the ideas, and the inspiration to help future-proof your career and your organization. If you want to get access to more content, such as podcast transcriptions and information on working with me or having me keynote your next event, you can visit my website at thefutureorganization.com. 
If you want to take your education even further by getting access to courses that explore these themes in more depth, then check out futureofworkuniversity.com. Also, if you get a few seconds, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes or whatever your preferred channel is. It really helps the show, and I personally appreciate it, since the podcast does take quite a bit of effort to produce. In case you're interested in sponsoring the podcast or working with me, my email is jacob at thefutureorganization.com. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Future of Work show with Jacob Morgan. Today's guest is Tom Rath. He is the best-selling author of many books, including one that I'm sure all of you have heard of called Strengths Finder 2.0, and he has a brand new book, which I had the opportunity to read. It's called Life's Great Question, Discover How You Contribute to the World. Tom, thank you for joining me. Thanks so much. It's an honor to be with you. So before we jump into all the fun stuff in the book, which by the way was was a, a lot of fun to read, there were some very valuable insights in here. Um, let's start with some background information about you. How did you get involved with this stuff, with, with Gallup, with all the work that you've been doing? Yeah, you know, I uh, started off, uh, I, I kind of grew up in a family um, where my grandfather was a psychologist and teacher and uh, started a business when I was young, along with a lot of other uh, family members around me. And um, so when I was uh, graduating from Michigan after I finished my undergraduate back in the uh, late last few years of the 90s, um, Don, my grandfather, asked me to join him in working on a, a a research project that I'd been helping him with over the summers. And he was trying to take all this information that he'd accumulated on inventories of human talents that he'd done mostly in person to person telephonic interviews and put that on the internet. That was kind of the time of the emergence of the internet. So um, I moved back to Nebraska where Don was to spend some time working with him on this project, which was an amazing and uh, meaningful effort for the first few years. And the, the project we were working on ended up being called Strengths Finder, and that fed into a lot of the books that you mentioned and that uh, a lot of people may be familiar with. Um, and then about two or three years into that project, uh, found out that Don was ill with uh, stage four gastroesophageal cancer. And so uh, given how close the two of us had been, and I've I'd kind of become a self-taught expert in fighting cancer since starting to battle cancer when I was 16 years old at back then. Um, We traveled all over the country trying to figure out how to keep him alive a little bit longer and set aside some of the strength finder work we were doing at the time. And um, somewhere in the middle of that, we were down in Houston at a cancer treatment center. And Don had uh, always mentioned in his speaking and talks that, you know, it was too bad that we waited until people were gone to eulogize them and say all these great things about their life. So I wrote Don a 10 or 15 page letter about all the amazing things that he'd done for me in my life and uh, gave it to him at that hotel we were at in Houston. And I, it was one thing I learned is incredible moving experience. I'm really glad I did that. And I know it meant a lot to him. What surprised me most was a couple of days later, he said, you know, I've, uh, I've been reading, rereading that letter and uh, I spotted a real talent for bringing things to life with words in his, that's what he said. And um, he said, I think we should write a book about your story and this topic. And I think we should work on that book in the next two months. And, you know, it was kind of an interesting, I mean, interesting to ask that because I'd never considered myself a writer at all. In fact, I had an AP English teacher tell me to stick with numbers and math. So if Don hadn't challenged me to work on that project with him at, under really extreme circumstances there, I don't think I would have ever gotten involved in books and writing. So that's exactly what led to my spending a lot more time in that uh, area over the last 15, 20 years. Wow, that's a cool story. So this, uh, it's not something that you set out to do? No, not at all. I'm a lot more comfortable with a a spreadsheet and a computer screen than I am uh, sharing my writing and stories with people, especially or with speaking in front of audiences. None of those are things that have necessarily come naturally for me, but uh, Don was very helpful in uh, spotting something that he thought could make a difference for people and challenging both of us to do something there. And that book that we were working on turned out to, it was called How Full Is Your Bucket? And it went on to not only do really well as a business book back then, but now it's used in 
K-12 elementary schools all over the country, which is really fun to see how his work and legacy continues on like that. Wow. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. And then I guess, guess that brings us to your new book, Life's Great Question, which I believe is coming out next year, right? A couple more months from now. Yeah, it's out in February of 2020. There, there are actually two books. There's a the business book with the kind of application part of it and the website and profile people can build. And then there's also a pure story-based form that we've been working on with Amazon Original Stories that's more just all narrative that's out uh, early in early 2020 as well. Very cool. And and what led you to write this one? And what is this one even about? Yeah, the Life's Great Question book is the product of kind of the last three to five years. I've really been personally reflecting on, um, given my own kind of health challenges and threats to my mortality, what are the most important things for people to get focused on? In particular, most of my uh, writing and research is focused on that nexus of people and organizations and how can we help people to lead better lives through the organizations that they're a part of. And um, one thing I've observed after 20 years of kind of following this area is that we're often so quick to look inward and think about self-development and our own brand and how we can improve personally. And the more I've studied these topics, my my big takeaway is that we can get more done and life is less stressful and more liberating when we find real concrete ways to focus almost all of our energies on the contribution we're making to other people. And, you know, in addition to a lot of my early days with Don, what's really inspired me recently is, uh, you know, every so often you see the, the famous quote from Dr. King, and I, I think the exact quote is, uh, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And that, that sounds like kind of a broad existential question, but what I've learned is I ask myself that question almost every day because it's a really good way to orient my time in the next eight hours so I ensure that I'm spending good quality time with my kids that'll get to kind of grow and live on where I'm not there. I'm working on projects that will continue to grow and books that can continue to produce results when I'm not working on them in the moment. And when when you start to think about the meaningful influence of your work each day, it also just takes a lot of the small stressors off your plate where you're worried about things that are often internal. Actually, um, well, I'm sure a lot of people struggle with this. Uh, something I struggle with a lot because, um, you know, somebody that, that works for themselves I'm constantly caught up in like, uh, you know, the day to day proposals, projects, where's my speaking gig, you know, am I wake, making these videos? It's, you know, the day to day stuff. And sometimes it's a little bit hard to take that big picture perspective of like, what are you actually doing to help others? So I, I love that quote. I think that's actually how you start the book is with that quote, um, which I thought was mm-hmm. was a great one. Um, what are the things that you talk about very, very early in the book? And there are a lot of really wonderful quotes in there. But one of the first things that caught my attention was you said, move from you are what you do to you are how you help. And I thought maybe you can unpack that one for just a minute or two and explain what you mean by that. Yeah, you know, I've I've observed over the years and working with a lot of people to help them uncover their talents and develop as better leaders and the like that um, it's really easy to get caught up in having your I, entire identity based around what you do functionally in a given day. So I, when I go to a cocktail party or a soccer game uh, with my kids over the weekend, it's people are always asking, especially around here in Washington, D.C., what do you do? And that's if you're an attorney, if you're in commercial real estate, whatever it might be, that's kind of a, a part of your identity. And those generic labels people tell me about what they do Honestly, it doesn't tell me much about uh, who they are as a person or why they do what they do. And so I always ask a few more questions to unpack that about what they spend their time doing during the day and how that benefits people. And what I've found is the more that we can help people to get closer to the beneficiary of their efforts in a given day, it just makes us feel better about the work we're doing each day. If To, to kind of step back, the, the other second reason I wrote this book and worked on this kind of website and application around it is because 
I'm increasingly convinced that the typical relationship between a person and the organization they work for in society is flat out broken on average. Couldn't agree with you more. Most organizations are kind of a detriment to the health and well-being of the person. And it it doesn't need to be that way. There's a lot of evidence I've uncovered surrounding that. But um, I think we can kind of get people. my, My grandpa used to talk about this, too, that we can get people done through work. I think he said it like that. And that's the reason I love orienting my work towards organizations is because I think organizations are just the biggest and most influential social networks in the fabric of our society today. And that means they can be rallied to create a lot of improvement in people's lives if we start to ask those questions. What is wrong with organizations? You say kind of the relationship that we have is broken. Why is it broken and has it always been like this? Or has there ever been a time when when things were we're going well. You know, I think a lot of the um, basic structure and framework of what exists between people and organizations today is the product of more of an industrial area where um, I paid you a fee for a service. And if you completed said service, you received the monetary reward. And in reality, so that contract that exists today isn't that much further evolved than a basic monetary bribe. And we, but we don't, we fail to kind of talk about the realities of that in a lot of ways. And the, so that's where we're evolving from. And I think the question is how quickly can we get to a place where each of us as individuals and organizations start to say, are we be, are we producing people who are better off when they go home at night, they're healthier and they're more financially secure. That does matter. They have better relationships with their family members because they chose to be a part of this organization. And um, to be real honest with you, if you look at the arc of my own career, I've spent a lot of time on kind of employee engagement, employee experience type work. And companies have gotten really good at discerning how much discretionary effort they're extracting from us as individuals in a given day. That's that's almost down to a science. And companies should be doing that. But as much as I've spent five, 10 years trying to get companies to also measure and prove that they're adding to people's overall well-being and health and lives, they're just not getting there fast enough. So a key realization for me as I started to work on this book three plus years ago was I think we've got to challenge ourselves to say each of us has the responsibility to make sure that we're not tolerating a job or work that's making our lives worse at the end of the day than we were when we showed up in the morning. And we need to start to ask some of those critical questions. Ask the people around us. Ask your best friend or your spouse, you think I'm a better person because I'm doing this job right now versus where I was a year ago? And sometimes they can help kind of hold up a mirror where we need it as well. And this is, um, I mean, this is something I've explored for quite some time now as well. And yeah, I mean, this is a huge, huge challenge for a lot of organizations. I think thankfully, we're starting to see a little bit of movement in that direction. Uh, But I'm curious, why do you think that this is something organizations struggle with? Is it because they're just focused on the dollars and cents aspect of the business? Yeah, I mean, an organization today, in most cases, is not wired to put those things first. It's, it's, I mean, there's been so much uh, worthwhile emphasis on uh, the need to do things that are always kind of have fiduciary responsibility and it's in the best interest of shareholders is held out there. And it's, it's also just sometimes easier for leaders to default to a bottom line that's easier to find and read where measuring whether you're adding collective well-being to citizens or people that work for your company, that's hard to do and it's more subjective. Um, so I, I, I do agree with you, though, that I think one thing is the generation entering the workforce today has much higher expectations about a more holistic relationship and contract with their employer than people did when I was entering college or a generation before me. It gets better one generation at a time and that's speeding up. And I also see, I mean, a lot of the Frankly, a lot of the organizations I've worked with uh, in the Bay Area and CEOs I talk to there, they're kind of 
almost to that point where, of course, we care about well-being and we're doing all these things and we're looking at that very carefully. And then I'll spend time with groups on the East Coast or the Midwest, and it's more one in every 20 leaders really feel like they're doing a lot in that regard. So you can see how if that's a leading indicator, as it often is in business trends, that will start to shift kind of in an organizational societal level as well. But um, I think one thing I've been trying hard to do is to figure out anything that we can do to accelerate that important conversation because the, the right now my this is very subjective usually I'll add a million disclaimers if I'm talking about something without research without direct research behind it here but I think most of us are showing up for work in a given day and we're at about I don't know 30 40 percent of the potential we have in terms of having the energy we need to be our best and so we've got to find ways to put people's health and well-being and energy first, even just for the sake of productivity and quality and all these metrics that companies are really good at gauging today. I was just going to ask you about that because a lot of organizations, you know, they're trying to balance sort of like the productivity and the efficiency with the health be- or the with the health and well-being of their employees. And sometimes, and I don't know if you've ever had anybody say this to you, um, has anybody ever said, hey, Tom, you know, th- these types of things are expensive, right? Health and well-being programs, looking after our employees, that stuff costs money and we can't show a direct return on it. We're just focusing on kind of, you know, being being profitable, making more money because that's what our stakeholders and shareholders care about. Um, so are those two mutually exclusive or can one benefit the other? You know, not, not only are they mutual, they're not mutually exclusive where, I mean, if a person has more energy, there's all kinds of research showing how much more productive they are in less time and the like. And there's also a lot of good work emerging in the last 10 years. And I, we started to look at this when I was at Gallup a decade ago, that hours number 40 through 60 are nowhere near as good quality or productivity wise as hours zero through 20. And hours past 60 take 14 out of 15 outcomes downhill. So they're not mutually exclusive, as you mentioned. Another, The other thing is, To be really honest, and I I almost hesitate to say this because I've been involved in some of these industries for quite a while, but a lot of the money, the cash that uh, organizations spend on so-called wellness programs and the like right now, I just, you don't even have to do that. I don't even know if I'd bother because what I've learned the hard way is that if you're spending millions of dollars out of your HR and benefits department for wellness programs to motivate people to take more steps or eat better or whatever. And you have an executive team that's continually burning through people and expecting people to respond at 10 o'clock at night and at two in the afternoon on a Sunday. And they're kind of the opposite of the example. I think some of those programs might even do more harm than good. So just don't, I, I would start in a different directions. Say before you spend a dollar on one of those programs, make sure that your leaders are good role models. Because if your leaders aren't good role models, no one's going to feel like they have the permission to go move around and be active or work out more. They're not going to feel like they have the permission to say, I can't be there then because then I wouldn't even be able to get enough sleep to be competent. And so until leaders become a part of that conversation about well-being, I don't think it's going anywhere. Yeah, that's funny because I, I've uh, witnessed a lot of those organizations firsthand where they have these beautiful health and wellness centers and gyms and perks and healthy meals and snacks. And you talk to some of the employees there and and they hate their leaders uh, inside that organization. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and the analogy I always like to use, it's um, it's sort of like making upgrades to the outside of the car where you leave the engine the same. And right. We, we just kind of like paint the exterior. We we put a nice little spoiler on there. We change the rims, but it's still got that same crappy engine. It's that's been in that car for the last 30, 40 years. And um, yeah, I mean perks, and I think you would agree are are never a strategy. They're just kind of like a little icing on the cake. And got to start with with those workplace practices. Uh, and it, agree you know, with- it's interesting. The the thing I've learned is. Well, and I'm I'm someone who, even though I've written books on kind of health topics, I I would never 
uh, preach or advocate any health ideas or practices to any of my friends or family members. That's just not who I am. Um, and I think a lot of leaders put themselves in that same boat. But the refreshing thing I've learned is that leader, all leaders need to do is just be good role models. And if they only worry about that, that'll take care of 80% of it. And if some of, if some people like to advocate beyond that, that's great. But I think it's simple. It's as simple as leaders need to be good examples of those health and well-being practices, and then everything else can flow from there. Do you have any suggestions for what those types of practices might be? So for, for some leaders listening to this who want to be that role model, what should they do? How do they become that? Yeah, and I, you know, I, I wrote a book with like real with a hundred real specific ideas called Eat, Move, Sleep a few years ago on these practices. But the it starts with some basic things where, you know, I grew up in a real hardworking culture where no leader ever admitted that they needed a whole eight hours of sleep, but yet ninety seven point five percent of us do, and only two percent of us can get away with less than seven hours over a sustained period of time. So, I think talking about how you need sleep, you need thought time as a leader, and you respect people taking that time and you don't expect them to be up at all hours and responding. I think that's a big one because we don't talk about sleep enough in the workplace, but you know, I've spent some time with the Army's former Surgeon General, Patty Orojo, and she talks about sleep as ammunition for their for troops' brains in the battlefield. And she compares sleeplessness to having troops in combat who are intoxicated in the field and how you can't afford that. And we've got to start to think about sleep like that and talk about it. You know, I've changed the way I deal with my kids in that regard, where I don't send my kids to bed if they're being bad. Think about the message those little things send. Instead, the first thing I ask my kids in the morning is, did you get a good night's sleep? And if not, how do we fix that? So I think for leaders to talk about things like sleep, for leaders to show and demonstrate that they value getting activity throughout the day, they're not sitting hunched over in meetings all the time where people don't even have the implicit permission to stand up and walk around a room when you're in meetings. You've got to find more active ways to learn and move around. I I shadowed the CEO of uh, Steelcase, a big furniture company, for part of a day about a year ago. And um, boy, it was inspiring the way he just... Every time he's on a phone call, he's on his headset pacing up and down the hallway. And he's he also is intentional about not scheduling back-to-back meetings in the same room because it forces him to get up and move around their big campus and to have time to decompress after each meeting. Uh, Doug Conant, who is old CEO of Campbell's Soup uh, that I know, he talked to me about the way he just put on his white tennis shoes and walked all over their corporate headquarters for an hour or two a day because it built relationships. He had all these conversations he wouldn't have otherwise had and showed people he valued activity. So those those are a few little examples of what leaders can do. Those are great stories and they're simple and practical. So it's something anyone can do. By now, I hope we all know that a great employee experience is the ultimate win-win. Great for the employee and great for the organization. And this is something that I have studied for several years and have found to be the case in my own research happier, more satisfied, and engaged workers do better work, and that ultimately makes their company more successful as well as a great place to work. My good friends at Populo know this better than most. They're one of the leading authorities on employee communications and employee experience, and by the way, they just happen to be a great place to work too. They know creating an awesome employee experience isn't easy. And they also know it's going to get even more complex in the rapidly changing digital workplace. Where already 85% of organizations are expanding into new technologies like big data and analytics, cloud technology, automation, and artificial intelligence, there's a lot of change. And employee communications can either make or break organizations at a time of significant change. This is why my friends over at Populo just published an awesome new guide called The Role of Employee Communications in the Digital Workspace. I'm going to be sending around a link to this in my newsletter, so make sure you subscribe at thefutureorganization.com. Getting back to your book, one of the things that um, you also mentioned in there, and this is another quote, is you can't be anything you want to, but you can be a lot more of who you already are. And I read that quote and, you know, most people always say, especially parents to their kids, you know, you can be anything you want to be. And 
I'm sure a lot of listeners to this are thinking, wait a minute, did Tom just say you can't be anything you want to be? <laughs> so w- what do you mean by that? Uh, you know, I, this is what I've I learned from uh, my grandfather, Don Clifton, who started studying this topic back in the 1960s. And um, it really, and it's kind of the, the way I grew up and learning about this, is that if you think about it from a very practical standpoint, each of us is born with, I mean, very unique and distinct talents and abilities to do different things really, really well. And the, I mean, the good thing is everybody does have the potential to be great at something, I believe, or at least everybody has the potential to be better than a thousand other people at something. But to say that any of us, to say that, I mean, I always grew up wanting, dreaming of being the next Michael Jordan, but uh, gravity and genes and skill and all kinds of other things told me that that was not happening uh, by the time I was about 16, no matter how much I wanted and tried. Um, And I think it's once you realize that even if you can't literally be anything, there are a lot of areas where you can be great, then it, it, it feeds into a healthier mindset. And it's also the bigger thing that's challenged me in the last 10, 20 years as I've looked at this is we need to think about that equation from the perspective of how we spend our time. Because what I've realized is that if I spend my time trying to be a little bit good at everything, it almost eliminates my chances of being great at anything in life. Because you just try, if you try and be well-rounded, essentially, which is the other end of that continuum, you spread yourself so thin that you're just a watered-down version of yourself. So it's about focusing your time and efforts where they will yield the greatest return. Hmm. I, so I guess if you were giving advice to a, a child or to somebody else, you wouldn't say you can be anything you want to be, but you would use that exact quote, uh, you can be a lot more of who you already are. Right. And I mean, and I've seen this from day one with my kids are now uh, eight and 10, but you can see it when they're three or four the way. I mean, my, my son just has this, this curiosity and asking questions that just won't quit and will never stop and does that better than anyone I've known. And he has a distinct personality and distinct talents that are just night and day different from my daughter, who's more quiet and inquisitive. And I, I have to literally put my face between her and a book to get her out of that book because she's so deeply focused in there. And there, there are these things that you see at young ages that uh, kids start to do so well without any, with the same environment. I mean, they both have the same nurture and environment, essentially. And I think the really exciting thing is to begin to help kids at a younger age to capitalize on the areas where they're already naturally excelling. The the study that uh, Don had Gallup ask people, I think it was almost 20 years ago now, was, you know, let's say your child shows up at home with the following grades, an A, a C, and an F. Which grade deserves the most time and attention? And in every country, Gallup conducted that study in seven countries, and in every country, the vast majority of parents obviously said the F deserves the most time and attention. But it's a trick question, because if you really think about where that young person, in the example, the young woman, let's say, has the most potential for success and development and growth 10, 20, 30 years down the road, I'd bet all my chips it's in the area where she's getting an A when she's in grade school and not in the area where she's getting the F. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, that speaks volumes to me because I was never a good student. So (laughs) 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 that sounds a lot like some of my grades. Um, no, and, I, and I think that makes a lot of sense. We tend to very much focus on the weaknesses um, in ourselves and in our people instead of focusing on the strengths. And that's one of the things that, that I, I talk about as well in my upcoming book on, on leadership uh, coming out in January is, is great leaders typically do that and they do a very good job of that. Uh, very much related to this, and this is going to be very controversial. I know a lot of people are, are going to be um, sending questions or asking about this. There is a big sort of culture now, and you typically see this with celebrities, with people who are very successful, and you know, every time they get an award or every time they get a platform, they always say, you can follow your dreams, follow your passions. Where do you stand on that? Would you give that advice to somebody of just follow your dreams, follow your passions? You know, I, as I've uh, aged, I guess, to put it frankly, um, I, one of the things I like most, I get most excited when I feel like something I've kind of assumed or believed for a long time is proven wrong. I, 
I get up each morning and read to, hoping to prove myself wrong at this point. Um, so 10 years ago, I would have said, yes, that's great advice. The more I've studied this topic and looked at a lot of recent research and studied people who have spent a lot of time digging into this in more depth than I have, I think that following your passion as a primary goal, excuse me, is a little bit uh, perhaps misguided in that we're better off following our contributions and where have we done things that have made a difference for other people that can have a positive influence on the world. Because if you really get into looking at passions, I might be very passionate about my golf game or my obscure stamp collection or whatever it might be. But if that doesn't serve the world or serve a broader purpose for the world, I'm not sure it's as sustainable or as valuable for society over time. And so one thing I challenged myself to do, which I hadn't spent time on before, and I kind of ask people to do and walk through as a part of the book, Life's Great Question, is to start with what the world needs and then map back and say, how can you leverage your natural talents, like we were just talking about, to best meet what the world around you needs? And I think if you start with your con- what you can contribute and what the world needs, you're essentially starting with a more meaningful end in mind than just starting with passion. Yeah, I, th- I think that's great advice as well. I mean, I I was in the same boat where I always believed that kind of follow your passions, follow your dreams. But the more I sort of progressed in my career, I realized that it's better to just bring your passion with you to the work that you're doing if you can. Uh, instead of just kind of trying to chase that, you know, in my case, I'm passionate about chess and racquetball and, uh, you know, gotta be honest, I don't, I don't see a bright future in my, my chess career or my, (laughs) my racquetball career. Uh, so instead, you know, I bring the passion that I have for certain areas into this kind of work, um, you know, the, in the leadership and employee experience stuff. And so I, I tend to very, very much agree with you that, um, that's probably not the best piece of advice that we want to be giving people. And, you know, the other thing is, yeah, I think as I've gotten older and with some of my own challenges and health threats and everything we talked about, um, I I think there's more and more desire to uh, spend an hour of time and energy on something that can, can continue to grow in your absence, whether that's a project uh, you're working on that yields dividends for people who go through a program or read a book or um, an hour you invest in somebody's development who looks to you for leadership or work. Uh, all those things kind of get to live on and they'll keep growing. I, I mean, hopefully for generations to come, whereas the, the great racquetball game will live on in the glory in your mind, but it might not <laughs> have an influence a generation from now, right? That's, that's probably, yeah. That's. <laughs> I don't think anybody in a generation is going to be looking at my uh, racquetball videos on YouTube. <laughs> as much as that would be nice, I don't think it'll happen. Uh, the subtitle of your book is Discover How You Contribute to the World. How do you discover that? Um, that's that's really what I spent a lot of time working on, is how can you help people to unpack that in a, in a really practical way. And um, one of the things I quickly realized I started working on this is that our current means for summarizing our life's work, e.g. a resume, couldn't be less personal and more sterile if we tried to make it so. And as I realized just how insufficient those means are, that what I've been trying to assemble is an online activity for readers of the book. So everybody reads a book, has a code to go build this profile. And that profile asks people some of the more meaningful questions. So what are the big roles you play in life that you want to be remembered by? So for me, that's being a dad, a husband, and a researcher. And what are the life experiences that have most influenced my work? So I put those into this system. And then I say, what are my natural strengths, like we've been talking about? And then I go through a series of questions that ask me about how I want to contribute in my current work. And I think as people go through those activities and it puts together a nice one-page baseball card of discovering how you contribute to the world, I hope that not only is that insightful for each reader as an individual, 
but most importantly, that they use it to have a discussion with a peer, with a loved one, ideally with a team they're working with to say, here's how each of us can optimize our contributions to this effort so we're not all doing the current default, which is running a thousand miles an hour in the same direction and hoping things turn out well. You have a more uh, practical and scripted conversation about how each person can make a complimentary contribution to a team, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I mean, it's funny just how lame and outdated a traditional resume is. Uh, and it's, I don't know how many decades old a resume is when those things were even created. Uh, but it's still very much what we use now. Um, and the scary thing is now that we even have uh, algorithm and bots who review resumes of human candidates to look for certain keywords to decide if those people even deserve a chance to interview with the company. And there's no focus at all on uh, on your purpose, on your contributions. It's really just about you know these keywords and the skills that you might be able to bring to the company. Uh, very impersonal indeed. Um, you actually broke your book up into three areas, which were create, relate, and operate. And I know we just have like 15 minutes or so left. Can you give maybe uh, a couple sentences about each one of those just so that listeners can start to think in terms of those three uh, those three buckets and what they should start doing? Yeah, and the, those, uh, those three categories you mentioned I, were just a product of my reflection about what are the three things that any team we get together uh, from a work standpoint essentially needs to do there are there are a lot more things they need to do but what are the what are the fundamental things you need present around each team from a contribution standpoint um the the first one you mentioned is we need to create something we've got to we've got to find a way to put something together and you know that's a an interesting example because most times when i join a team we kind of form teams with like-minded people and so i end up on a team with a lot of people who want to create stuff and then because we're just all stuck in this, we want to create new things and have a vision about what's next. We spend all that time in that area and we don't spend as much time in that second kind of team category that's about relating to one another. And that's the one spot where I think most work teams today are the most efficient, where they don't spend enough time having people who are dedicated to saying we need to build stronger relationships and continue to grow so that we can keep connecting one another and having a bigger influence on the world and energizing our efforts on a daily basis. And so that's that's a piece that's often absent. And then the, the third area that a team has to operate and execute and get things done. And so um, we often just jump into things and forget to look at that as well. And any successful team has to have people who are essentially achieving and getting things done. And they've got to have people who are figuring out how they adapt to changing environments and organizing our efforts so they can scale and reach more people over time. So that's a, a real quick synopsis of some of the core elements that we need present around a team. And, you know, you don't even need a the online tool or the book. To, I think for any time you're bringing a team together to just sit around and say, what do we each want to contribute and how can we kind of balance that out so we get the things done that we're supposed to do? 98% of teams I see today don't even have a basic expectations one-on-one conversation like that, but they need it. Yeah. No, they should, uh, both individuals and for teams. Uh, I think it's very helpful for everyone. You talk a lot about purpose in the book, and I've talked about purpose with several podcast guests in the past as well. Is purpose something that you find, and who is responsible for your purpose? I think that finding purpose and finding your greatest contribution is almost always a journey, and it takes It takes a lifetime. And then it's just about how far you've made it along that continuum. You know, I've I've, uh, often joked that I've, but it's true. I've never met anyone who just fell out of college right into the perfect position. And um, I've also never met anybody who experienced a career growth pattern that was just perfectly linear and a nice smooth growth curve. It's almost always you take two steps back, you take three steps forward, you take a step back, and it's, it's spiky and it's bumpy. And I think finding your purpose and contributions over time is spiky and bumpy as well. And it's why it's also important to 
not view your career progression as as kind of an all or nothing thing where oh this job's just all bad i need to find a whole new one i think in most cases there's more room for growth kind of honing the job that you have into one that you can grow in and love over time as there is jumping from one job to the next and um usually we just don't take enough time to step back and say how can I see the meaningful contribution being produced through my current work? And how can I adapt my day to contribute even more and have higher well-being in the process in a job that's – We got. I think we guys are thinking about uh, purpose and job that's more sustainable over time as well, where it's not run, run, run to burn yourself out and then fall back, but you create a curve that you can at least smooth it out as much as possible over time. And, and there's, you know, there's a lot of conversation now with leaders helping their employees find that sense of purpose. Is it up to the leader? Is it up to the company? Is it up to the individual? Or who's ultimately responsible for helping you find or, or discover or uncover what that purpose is, what those contributions are? Companies absolutely need to do more. And leaders need to spend more time helping people map that out. But I think the ultimate accountability lies with each of us as individuals. And until we take the responsibility and the initiative to say, I'm going to make sure that my life is better off because I chose this work, and I'm going to make sure that I'm making a meaningful contribution and feel like my job has purpose because of this work, I don't think that any of us can afford to sit back and wait for uh, even a good leader or a great organization to do that for us. And lo- I love that message. Don't don't wait for others. You got to step up and do something yourself. Um, maybe one of the last things I'll ask you here is uh, something else you mentioned in the book, and that is that the big assumption is that you have to do something. You have to work. And I think that's the assumption that most people have is that it's something that is essential. They have to do it. Why is that assumption wrong, and what do you think we should be shifting that conversation to instead? Yeah, I I think if you start your day and look at just more, I mean, go granular in terms of looking at the the tasks that you often undertake in a given day. And, I mean, we're all going to have to do things each day that – are not that fun. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. One of the really good questions that Gallup has asked for a long time is uh, I have the opportunity to do what I do best every day. And if you really think about the semantics of that question, it's not saying I get to use my strengths all the time, the whole day I'm at work. It's I have a chance to do what I do best for a little bit of a day. And so we just we just need to find a few moments in our daily routine and tasks where we can say, here's exactly how my daily efforts yield a positive outcome for another human being. And we've got to find more ways to see that clearly each day. It's what, a few things that fascinated me as I got into some of this research is, you know, even in, in uh, restaurants and food service, if the person preparing the food, the chef or the cook, can see the customers instead of being walled off behind concrete, they make better quality food that the customers rate as tasting better and it's more nutritious. And even in a profession like uh, radiology, where I've spent enough time with radiologists over the years that I would assume they know that they're helping people battle cancer and that's meaningful work, right? But when radiologists have a simple photo of the patient appended to the radiographic record, they write more thorough and in-depth reports and they're more accurate in their diagnosis over time. So we've just got to find little ways to bring the humanity back into that daily routine, essentially. Hmm. Well, to uh, to wrap up, do you have any advice or parting words of wisdom, uh, maybe for, for employees and also for leaders inside of organizations? Um, what should they be doing to help answer this question? I would say for leaders, we need to have a much bigger and broader and richer conversation about contribution in the modern workplace. And I I, I think the future of work, to to the topic of a lot of your work, I think the future of work lies in a much healthier and more mutual and reciprocal relationship between people and organizations. And it's up to leaders to help people start getting ahead of that today. And the leaders who do that 
are going to find that their organizations have a huge competitive advantage and a much greater uh, value proposition to employees in the future. Starts with leaders. And then what about if you're not a leader? Uh, is there anything that you can start doing it's just as an individual? I, I would say at an individual level, uh, start when you think about your own health and well-being, Follow the tried but true metaphor of putting your own oxygen mask on first, because if you don't ensure that you're in a, in a good place physically, psychologically, minimizing stress each day, there's no way you have a chance to be your best for other people. So I would start with that and then begin to map out once you can be fully energized, how you can make even greater contributions to other people each day without sacrificing your own health and well-being. Perfect. I, I love uh, I love that advice. Uh, well, where can people go to learn more about you, the book, uh, anything that you want to mention for people to check out? Please feel free to do so. Yeah, people can uh, go to tomrack.org to learn about any of the books and topics that we've talked about. And the contribify.com website is the uh, new application where readers of the Life's Great Question book can build a profile around where they best contribute over time and start that discussion. Very cool. Well, Tom, thank you for taking time out of your day to speak with me. Thanks so much. It's been an honor and a fun conversation. Yes, yes. It was a lot of fun to talk to you. And thanks everyone for tuning in. My guest again, Tom Rath. Make sure to check out his brand new book, Life's Great Question. Discover how you contribute to the world. And I will see all of you next week. Thanks for tuning in to the Future of Work podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please do me a favor and rate and review the show on iTunes or whatever your preferred podcast platform is. And remember, if you want to take your education even further by getting access to courses based on some of the themes that I explore in this show, then check out futureofworkuniversity.com. If you're interested in being added to my newsletter, you can do that by visiting thefutureorganization.com forward slash newsletter. And you can also get in touch with me directly if you have any inquiries for podcast sponsorships, working with me or having me keynote your next event. My email is jacob at thefutureorganization.com. I will see you next week.